Studies show that all over the world, the older population is growing, and in many societies, seniors spend most of their days alone. There are many effects of isolation, stress, depression, an increase in unhealthy habits like smoking, drinking, and neglect of physical activity, and a risk of quicker mental decline due to the lack of stimulation. As we strive to reach people in urban areas under the Mission to the Cities initiative, how can we connect with this group that spends a majority of their time in isolation. What can one do to serve the seniors in the cities? A church in Vancouver, Canada started a senior's garden after the pastor heard about a local couple who had their own special garden. This couple was experiencing loneliness and disconnection. And so they started a We Grow You Pick garden in their front yard to connect with their neighbors. This successful project was the starting point for a large garden at a local Adventist church. Projects like this can provide seniors with a place to come together and mingle with one another while working toward a common goal. In South Korea, members of the Seoul Central Church are caring for the elderly by running a senior citizen ministry. The church provides food to the elderly every Sabbath and extends their help even further by providing bus fare for the trip to and from the church every other week. What were Ellen White's thoughts on the elderly? In the book, The Ministry of Healing, she writes, there is a blessing in the association of the old and the young. The young may bring sunshine into the hearts and lives of the aged. Those whose hold on life is weakening need the benefit and contact with the hopefulness and buoyancy of youth. In Pennsylvania, Members of a church provide lawn and yard care to seniors who are homeowners and unable to care for their yards on their own. There are many opportunities to serve seniors in the cities, from providing basic home repairs to offering exercise programs and outings meant specifically for the elderly. Visit the Mission to the Cities website for more ideas on how to serve your city's most vulnerable residents. Following Christ's method of ministry and filled with His Spirit, you can impact someone's life today. Please pray for the ongoing work of reaching the unreached. Thank you for supporting Mission to the Cities. A very good morning. A warm welcome and a blessed and happy Sabbath to everyone this morning. This morning as we welcome, maybe we can, I don't have a guest book with me, but any guests in our midst, can have a show of hands? Okay, not for today. So today, we let us now uh, welcome one another. We can uh, wave our hands, a very happy Sabbath to each one of you. Very warm welcome and very happy Sabbath. May you be blessed today in our worship and fellowship together. Praise God. This morning, we have a number of announcements before we begin our worship. The first is a gentle reminder, in two weeks' time, on the Sunday, there will be our church cleaning that we'll be doing. So please let uh, Sister Janelle know uh, if you will be attending, and we hope that you will be doing so. And uh, we'll need to order lunch for you, so please let us know the numbers by next Sabbath. Uh, please let us know. Thank you. Tomorrow, we have the church board meeting uh, at 10 a.m. on Zoom. So for members, we just ask you to pray for us as we make decisions for our church in our mission and in the work of the church. I would like to invite Pastor Chan to share more about our upcoming activity by the health ministry. Good morning and happy Sabbath. The health ministries of Ballastia consists of uh, Brother Victor, Sister Lana, Sister Shao, and myself. Uh, we come up with different themes for each month. So for the month of July, 
we are following the Singapore uh, Green in Initiative. There are key targets, and we pick up one of the key targets is uh, sustainable living, where the government has this target of by 2030, uh, we will be having 30% uh, of uh, locally produced foods. So we will be visiting three places where we will learn to uh, plant our own vegetables, okay, fruits and vegetables. First, we will visit the rooftop garden at Marceling, where Brother Victor has been volunteering every Sunday okay, at the multi-storey car park. Uh, he will share with you uh, his produce and the community service that he has been doing by giving extra vegetables to uh, needy families. And then we will also visit uh, Farm 85 at Lim Chu Kang, uh, where there are 15 varieties of uh, fruits and vegetables. Okay. We will learn how we can grow our own vegetables even in our apartments. And then the last one, will be, we will be visiting Bollywood veggies, where we learn to grow organic food. And then we will have, there, have lunch there. So we start on a Sunday, 31st of July at 10 a.m. So we will also like to encourage the green uh, to have green initiative where those who are driving, please come with your car to join us because we don't want to book a bus because it will contribute to more uh, CO2 pollution. So we will all gather at MRT, at Marceling, MRT, at a car park. Okay, we will gather around 9.30, 10 o'clock sharp, we will move from there. So we will carpool. So the sign-up will begin next week. Okay, more, more announcement will be given. So we encourage everyone to join uh, this uh, green initiative. Thank you. Thanks, Pastor Chan. So this will be end of July. So please take note and uh, prepare yourself so we can all go together on this initiative. Next, we have uh, the care packs that we previously announced, but now we have started giving out some of the care packs. So if uh, you know yourself or any other members uh, have COVID or uh, please uh, let the pastors know and we will be uh, happy to share with you a care pack uh, to wish you well in your recovery. So let us know and uh, we extend our care to each of you. Next week, we have a Father's Day. We just have a simple program. So uh, please be here and may you be blessed by the program. This, in continuing with our vision of prayerful, loving community, uh, if you see in the bottom left, uh, we ha I visited one of the persons from the care corner, and that is uh, also what we'll be doing in the community services. Yeah? So for those who have joined or are still thinking of joining, uh, you can extend our love and care by talking to some seniors or uh, by letting Sister Caroline know, and you may be there to also extend, uh, be the arms and feet of Jesus to some other seniors in our community. So the, the rest are the visitations and uh, distribution of care packs. This, today, as we continue to pray for our members, we are praying for the Saliot family, our brother Gerard, sister Lana and Louis, uh, sister Alicia and brother Richard Wong and family, brother Lawrence, Sito and family, and sister Pauline Ng and family. So we keep them in prayer as we have our start our silent prayer, as we start our worship, and as we celebrate together today, the Women Emphasis Day uh, through our worship. So let us pray as we start our worship.
stand for the doxology. Let us remain standing as we seek the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this privilege of being in your presence. Dear God, we are gathered here today, both physically and online, to worship and bless you. Father, we thank you because you are our God, creator and saviour. Father, we glorify your name, for you are eternal and almighty. Keep our hearts attuned to your word and in aligned with your will. Bless us beyond all measurement, Lord, beyond all measure and fill us with your peace and strength. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Let us remain standing for our two hymns of praise. Great is thy faithfulness, followed by under his wings.
good morning and a very happy Sabbath to you. When we return tithe and offering, we are honouring God. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 to 10. Honour the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thy increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. It is a way of thanking God for all that He has provided in our lives and He supplies all our needs by His riches and the glory by Christ Jesus. And the least we can do is to honour Him with the first fruit of our increase, 10% of our salary. But that is not that God I mean, that is not the end of the verse. The Lord says, so your barns will be filled with plenty. We try to show that we serve an awesome God. It is God who owns everything on earth and beyond and is holy to Him. When we try, we offer up to Him, we live up to Him, what is His? and show that we recognize His ownership as a constant blessing upon us all. So when we tithe, we make room for blessings. You know, tithing is also a, a way of thanking God uh, for His blessing and make rooms for future blessings. Uh, love gives, John 3.16. Give only because you want to. Jesus is our awesome example. He had it all in heaven and, get, and yet He gave up all for us. He made him, He made Himself poor that we would be rich. So where is your heart? There is no treasure on earth like the treasure that awaits us in heaven. Isn't that ultimately that we all awaits the most important treasure? Shouldn't that be where our hearts lies? Uh, let us pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we are indeed thankful that uh, for this Sabbath day, we are thankful for the gift of your Son, Jesus who loved us so much that He came to die for us, to redeem us. Now we want to give what You have blessed us, a portion that to further Your cause. We pray that You will bless this offering and this tithe so that Your work will advance and may we continue to be a shining light to His and Christ's second coming. Thank you for hearing our prayer and for blessing all of us as we commit the rest of the worship into your hands. In Christ's precious name, I pray. Amen. Um, please do come to the front to return your tithes and offerings in the boxes here provided.
to have a child, but no baby came, and she often cried about this. Hannah and Elkanah loved God very much. They would visit his holy temple in Shiloh every year and celebrate with a big meal, but this year Hannah wasn't hungry. So Hannah left the table and went to the temple to pray. She thought she was all alone. She prayed from her heart and asked the Lord to give her a son. She said if he would give her this child, she vowed to give him back to the Lord. Hannah was praying silently and her lips were, were moving, but no sound was coming from her. When Eli the high priest saw her, he thought she was drunk. He confronted her about it and told her to put away the wine. She told him she was not drunk, but was sorrowful and pouring out her heart to the Lord. After she told him her story, he understood what was happening. He told her to go in peace because the Lord was going to answer her prayer. Hannah believed the word of the priest Eli. 
she was a changed person and not sad anymore. Hannah joined her husband back at the table. She was now a happy, joyful person because she knew in her heart that she would have a son just as the priest had said. They returned to their home excited at what was coming soon. God happily answered Hannah's prayer and a baby boy finally came. Hannah named him Samuel, which means because I asked the Lord for him. God had heard her prayer and answered it. Hannah and Elkanah loved baby Samuel dearly. Hannah had promised God that she would give him Samuel. She told Elkanah what she wanted to do. Elkanah understood what had to be done. The promise to God must be kept. When Samuel was a toddler, Hannah and Elkanah took him to the temple in Shiloh to worship. They thanked God for their baby with sacrifices. When Hannah saw Eli, she told him she was the woman who had prayed there earlier. She then left Samuel at the temple to be raised by Eli the priest. Samuel was dedicated to the Lord all the days of his life. While Samuel was in Shiloh serving the Lord, Hannah did not forget about her child. Oh no, he was on her mind all the time. And every year, as he grew taller and taller, she came back and brought him a robe that would be just the right size for him. God also bless Hannah with more children. She and Okana had three more sons and two more daughters. We learn from Hannah the value of persistence in prayer. Hannah did not give up. She continued to pray. God will not withhold anything which would be good for us. Sometimes we cannot determine what would be best for us, but God knows. Jesus said, if a child asks a father for bread, he will not be given a stone. And if he asks for fish, he will not be given a snake. God is our Father, and He will give good things to those who ask Him. We also see the dedication and unselfishness of Hannah when she returned her young son to the service of God. We must be generous with the things God gives us, be willing to share them with others, and let those things be used for God's glory.
as far as possible and we're comfortable, please kneel with me in prayer. As we kneel before you this Sabbath morning, kind and loving Father in heaven, as we lift our hearts and voices and praises and thanksgiving to you, we are grateful that you are here in our midst. We confess that we are sinners for whom you have paid a great price. We humbly ask for your forgiveness for the times when we stray out of your will, when we get distracted and detour from the loving plan you have for our lives, for our eternal salvation. We are joyful and delighted to be in your presence and to experience your forgiveness, your exceeding patience, and how bottomless and infinite the depth and breadth of your love for us. Thank you for being our shepherd so that we lack nothing and can trust in you for all our needs. Thank you for sustaining us in green pastures and giving us peace by still waters in the midst of a brewing global storm. We are not anxious and we can sleep deeply. We praise you for restoring our soul and comforting us with your rod and staff and for your guidance down in and through the paths of righteousness so that you can get all the honor and glory you rightfully deserve. We are comforted by your promises that even if we glimpse the cloak and the shadow of death, no evil will befall us because you are present and will carry us through any trials and challenges. Because of your goodness, we can hold our heads up high when our accusers when we are faced by our accusers and we long for your good name to be vindicated at long last after 6,000 years of misrepresentation. Your blessings have overflowed many, many times and we are assured that goodness and mercy will be the foundation stones of our paths because our destination is clearly in sight. We long for our heavenly home. Following Jesus' example, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices to you because Christ's blood offering has cleansed us. Through his merit, we have been redeemed as your children. Thank you so much for the opportunity to serve in your grand plan for salvation and redemption. It's so amazing how you patiently unfold your mysterious ways ever so gently to us, always respectful of our capacity to choose between good and evil and to align our choices according to our conscience. We are humbled and amazed as to your wonderful love, grace, and mercy in the way you deal with others and with us. We are willing to be useful as your instruments for your purposes. So work in us and through us and for us to achieve your high and lofty goals. As those who have come before us have lit the pathway of faith, Give us the courage to boldly follow the path through trials and challenges. Help us when we are weak and may others not stumble or get discouraged on their way because of our foolishness, pride, impulsiveness, or bad habits. May we call out with urgency Jesus' soon and imminent return as he wraps up his ministry as mediator, atoning for our sins. We are homesick. Lord, at the things of the earth all look so dim, temporary and fake because our eyes are turned to Jesus. Eternal Father, we uplift our leaders to you. May you give the leaders of the Singapore Conference a compelling vision that will continue to fan the fire of faith in our hearts, that there will be room in your house of worship for the truth seekers you're sending into your fold. Bless the General Conference sessions in St. Louis, and may you guide the delegates in their votes for the World Church, that there will be unity in the sounding of the final loud cry as one voice. Bless pa Pastor Matthew Yuan, Pastor Chen Rong, and retired Pastor Mark and their families. Also continue to pour out your blessings 
on each of the families in our congregation. We especially uplift the Salyat family, Jared, Lena, and Louise, Alicia and Richard Wong and family, Lorencito and family, and Perlin Ng and family. Draw near to each member gathered here, online, or zooming in at home, the homebound, the bedbound, and reassure every one of us that you are the provider of each and every one of our needs, and even our wants. Master Healer, bring your healing touch to those who are unwell. Bring comfort, pain relief, rest and recovery in accordance with your goodwill. Grant safe passage to those who are on the road, traveling or making plans to travel. Preserve the lives and livelihoods of those who are displaced, homeless, fleeing calamity, natural or man-made, or war. As you have led the men of faith in ancient times, guide the men gathered and inspire them to fulfill their calling to be priests of their households, moral and spiritual leaders. Bless the women so they will not tire or become discouraged in bridging different parts of our church kampong community together. Help each of us to uphold the torch of faith in word and deed, to be examples and teachers of the young seekers as our world spirals ever so quickly up and down, spinning in and out of economic, digital, or spiritual tunnels and mazes. We pray that your spirit will move in this sanctuary powerfully this morning, that you will warm our hearts to receive the lessons you want us to learn, warm our feet so that we will go out of our comfort zones, warm our hands so that we will minister to the needs of others. May your spirit fill Dr. Sally Poon so that she can be your mouthpiece, and that your, wo your words will fall on willing ears and open hearts. Renew us so that we will leave this place having hope and faith in your promises, which you are ever faithful to keep. Delay not the return of your son because we are homesick, dear Father. We thank you for listening to our praise and worship and drawing near and into our hearts. In the blessed name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Psalms 31, verse 23 to 24. I'm reading from the New King James Version, and it reads, O oh, love the Lord, all you his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful and fully repays the proud person. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, and, you, and all you who hope in the Lord. Let us prepare our heart uh, for the message this morning. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and to my sisters, a very wonderful Women's Ministries Emphasis Day today. Our speaker today is Dr. Sally Poon, and I think we don't need too much of an introduction, but still. Uh, Dr. Sally Poon has retired from the Northern Asia Pacific Women's Families and Children's Ministries six years ago, but she's never retired. She's been busy, she's been working, she's been mentoring, including me. And uh, in fact, she has just concluded an evangelism outreach in Mount Moriah Church in Jakarta. And today, Dr. Sally Poon, as usual, has got this uncanny way of presenting a very powerful message, which is just what we need for this time we are in. Heroine of courage, and faithfulness. 
Dr. Salipun is going to give us the bread that we need to hear this morning. So let us hear, let us listen, and let us plan to go. Morning, everyone, and happy Sabbath. I have many friends among you, and I want to greet each one of you. Today is Women's Ministries Emphasis Day. And let me assure you that Women's Ministries has nothing to do with women's liberation in the Adventist Church. Our emphasis is on women, very softly, in ministry for the Lord. And once a year, we celebrate that. You know, today, if I were to tell you that I'm going to talk about heroines, who would come to mind? You probably will think of maybe Sarah or Esther. How about Deborah or Hannah, like we heard in the story just now? Thank you to those uh, who made so much effort to bring us the children's story. I really enjoyed that. Or perhaps Mary. No, I'm not going to talk about any of these women. A friend and ex-colleague of mine, Mrs. Obomo Nike Sesu, what a name, huh? from the West Central African Division. She's the Women's Ministries Director. She shared with me two heroines in the Bible whom probably I have read about time and again, but never remembered their names. Maybe you know their names. Shipra and Pua. I will not ask for a show of hands how many of you have heard of them. But definitely their names never stuck in my mind because I've read their story in Exodus many, many times. There was a new pharaoh on the throne of Egypt. And this pharaoh chose to forget about Joseph and all the good he did during that terrible uh, seven years of famine where the whole world came to Egypt to get food after the famine was over the Israelites settled in the land and they grew and grew and grew and this new Pharaoh we are talking about maybe over 300 close to 400 years later forced the Israelites or the Hebrews as they are called into hard labor, hoping to reduce their population. And of course, he reaped the benefits of having a lot of uh, great monuments built for him. However, the harder the women worked, the more fruitful they were. There was a huge population explosion, and Pharaoh felt threatened. He was fearful. He was afraid. He doubted their loyalty. And he viewed these Israelites or Hebrews as aliens. So in uh, Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, we have the story of Pharaoh's population control scheme. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom one was named Shipra and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. Birth stools. I went into the, uh, in Google and looked it up, and the first birth stool was recorded way back in 1450 BC. Now that's, what, 
long time ago, thousands of years ago. And today you can see this birth stool and a queen sitting on it giving birth at the birth house at Luxor, Egypt. In the 1980s, this birth stool made a comeback and expecting mothers reverted to this way of delivering babies. They sit upright and the researchers have found that the gravity allows the expulsion of the baby to take place more easily. It speeds up the time of delivery and increases the comfort for the expecting mother because it allows all the muscles involved in the childbirth process to work more efficiently. How about today in Singapore? In the uh, Health Hub app and in Motherhood magazine, the birth stool is mentioned as one of the possibilities of the ways that an expecting mother can give birth. But of course, you must make arrangements way ahead of time for this to happen. So Shipra and Pua were summoned by Pharaoh. Why? Well, it appears that they were the leaders of the midwives to the Hebrew women. And they were entrusted with this personal assignment from the Egyptian king. Ellen White gives us a lot more insight into this. She says, Satan was the mover in this matter. He knew that a deliverer was raised up, was to be raised up among the Israelites, and by leading the king to destroy their children, he hoped to defeat the divine purpose. And if we pull back the curtain, we see a spiritual battle raging. God needed faithful warriors at this time of crisis to honour him through their courage and faithfulness. And Shipra and Pua took up the challenge. Apparently, the king never expected that these two women would disobey him. After all, he was the son of the gods, and everyone, without exception, obeyed without hesitation. By obeying, they would gain favour with the king, they would be given a lot of gifts, receive promotions, and gain popularity at court. But if anyone dared to disobey, everyone knew that it was career suicide and death. So did Shipra and Pua have a choice? If you look at it, from a human standpoint, they had no choice but to obey the king. But these two brave women chose to disobey. Why? We are told in Exodus chapter 1, verse 17, but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. Even under tremendous pressure, Shipra and Pua was motivated by the fear of God. Not the kind of debilitating fear that we experienced during the pandemic, but rather a deep and reverent awe and respect for God. Fear of God, if it is right, will always draw us closer to God, knowing that He loves us as a Heavenly Father and convince us to act according to His will. Proverbs 9.10 tells us, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Hence, the midwives resolved that they would not follow the king's orders to kill the baby boys. However, they had to cook up an explanation. They had to be creative. What if the king summoned them? And true enough, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 18, we are told, and the king of Egypt 
called for the midwives after a while when he realized the plan was not working and said to them, why have you done this thing and have saved the male children alive? And Shipra and Pua had their answer ready. They said, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. Yes, they had followed Pharaoh's instructions to the letter. He had said, kill the baby boys while the mothers are still sitting on their birthing stools, right? But you know, the midwives decided that they would slowly take their time. When they were called to deliver the babies, they decided to stall and not appear until the, ba the babies were, had been born and the mothers were back in bed. So when they came, the baby boys were safe and they didn't have to kill them. Although simply choosing to obey the king, although the command came from the highest authority, although disobedience meant death, Shipra and Pua chose to obey God. Yes, they obeyed the king to the letter, and he could not fault them. In life, all of us have our choices to make. Every day, we are faced with decisions. What would we choose to do? Ellen White says, He who has God's law written in the heart will obey God rather than men and will sooner disobey all men than deviate in the least from the commandment of God. God's people taught by the inspiration of truth and led by a good conscience to live by every word of God will take his law written in their hearts as the only authority which they can acknowledge or consent to obey. The wisdom and authority of the divine law are supreme. Councils for the Church, page 314. Little did Shipra and Pua realize the extent to which their courage and faithfulness would work out in the fulfillment of God's purpose and defeat Satan's plan. It was at this time that the baby Moses was saved at birth and Satan's plan was crushed and God's plan to raise up a deliverer from the slavery of Egypt came to fruition. The Israelites continued to grow and multiply. Praise God, Shipra and Pua were there at the right place, at the right time, doing the right thing. God could count on them to save his people. Because they were God-fearing, God blessed them with families of their own, and the Israelites continued to increase and become strong. What a perfect ending to this story. Now, as Christians in the 21st century, how do we develop faithfulness and courage? We have the reassuring news this morning that faithfulness and courage are planted like a seed in each one of us. We all have it when we are born. The challenging news is these two virtues must be nurtured and grown within. Faithfulness and courage have to be unleashed from inside of us as we grow spiritually with the help of the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, we are told 25 times to be bold and courageous. Courage is the ability to take risks, to make sacrifices. And as Martin, uh, Martin Luther King said, it is dangerously unselfish. It is the power of the mind to overcome fear. Courage helps us to stand firm on our beliefs and grow in times of crisis. 
It takes pra uh, practice to develop courage. And every time we choose to face life situations, courage grows. Some situations are very small and insignificant, we think, but courage is growing. For example, when you uh, get a little kid to learn to ride a bike, uh, to wave board, or to do something like this, it takes courage. Um, trying a new food, asking someone out on a date, takes a lot of courage. Or quitting a job that is too demanding and trying something new, stepping out into the unknown, takes courage. Or standing up against aggression, racism, prejudice, takes courage. Of course, we have the example of Jesus. Remember, he challenged the prevailing beliefs taught by the religious leaders. He was never afraid of the criticism and hatred of these leaders whom he embarrassed and enraged time and time again. How about faithfulness? Whether young or old, we all know that faithfulness means being intentional about connecting with God at the beginning of each day and surrendering ourselves to Him and His holy will and keeping our focus on Him throughout the day. Yes, sometimes our sinful nature will struggle to take control. Selfishness will rear its ugly head if we are not careful. The cares, riches and pleasures of this life choke out spiritual growth. But family worship, as well as personal time with God, is a must if we want to nurture faithfulness and courage. Cultivating these two virtues is so critical in raising kids in this day and age, where bullying is so rampant. Many children will have their self-worth trampled to the ground because of bullying. There's verbal bullying, social bullying, physical bullying, and now cyber bullying. I often watch a program called Talking Point on television. And the statistics they shared about Singapore is that one in three kids are bullied. Did you know that? One in four kids in Singapore is a bully. And in Singapore, bullying is a spectator sport. That's kind of sad. What are the effects of bullying? Victims experience physical, social, academic, and mental health issues. Often their grades tumble, they withdraw, they have a lot of fear. Bullies are also affected negatively. If the behavior is not corrected in time, problems arise where they cannot fit into society and may turn into alcoholics, school dropouts, they may become abusers of their partners in life and become criminals. Even those who are standing around just watching are affected. Observers often play truant. They are prone to the excessive use of tobacco, alcohol and drugs when adults and they develop either other psychological issues as they grow older. Hence, bullying has a lot of negative effects on those involved as well as on society as a whole. Brooks Gibbs is a social psychologist who has 20 years of experience with young people and he talks a lot about bullying. He proposes an amazing solution as to how to treat a bully. I'm going to show you a video now, a very short clip, where he's uh, giving a, a, a talk on bullying in a school, and he has up on the stage with him a student volunteer called Alex. And Alex is going to bully him. And he's going to demonstrate two ways of dealing with this bully. Listen, man, 
Nobody cares what you got to say, dude. You come up here thinking you're some kind of hot shot. Hey, man, I know everything about bullying. Nobody I do. cares, dude. Nobody cares, man. I Everybody don't... shows up here. They have to be here, dude. Shut Get up! Out of here. Shut your pie up! Try to come back here with bully remarks. I'm a freaking author, dude. You're an author, huh? Really? You're an author. You don't even know how to read. Read yourself to Bay, man. Come on, you're only here because you're What's your name? What? What's your name? I already told you my name. What, are you stupid? Would you forget my name? I told you my name's Alex, man. Are you wearing that duct tape on your mouth because your boyfriend put you there? Huh? Yeah. Everybody say it all because they know it's true, man. They know you're gay. You call me a name one more time, I'm gonna punch your face in. You punch my face in, you should be sorry. Bro, I can beat you so hard, man. You think you can fight me? Shut up, dear fella. Yeah, all right, say it right, right, you, you did a great job. No. All right, cool. All right, here's the thing. We're gonna play the game again. Keep insulting me. I'm gonna try to get you to stop. But keep insulting me. On count three, everyone say action. One, two, three. Action. Hey, everybody, look at me. Hi, guys. I wrote skits, everybody. I wrote skits. That's hilarious. Hey, everybody, look at me. I'm gonna make jokes because I think the bully me just Alex. made jokes. You just think this is Alex. so joke, man. You're sick, dude. It's like, my whole identity, my sense of happiness is not wrapped up in your approval of me. So it's cool. You, you can make fun of me. I'll, I'll never make fun of you, though. I, I really actually think you're a fun guy. You're pretty cool. Yeah? Yeah. You think that I'm a fun guy. I could learn a lot After from everything you. I just gave you. Oh, yeah, dude. I'm, <laughs> you're a fun guy, dude. Look how dynamic you are. You're, like, super outgoing. I wish I was like that. Like, I think that's amazing. You have a gift. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate it. I really do. I love it, dude. Thanks, man. You're a great guy, dude. Everybody cares. Everybody. Brooks gives, guy. Woo! Do you give up? Huh? Do you give up? Do I give up? Yes. You give up on you. Yes. Why do you like give up? Do you give up like making fun of me? Give a big hand clap. You did great. I got, I, I got a couple questions. Two questions. Let's, let's be honest with you, man. Sure. Um, this was invented by school psychologist Izzy Kalman. He's a pure genius. He's been working on bullying issues for over 30 years, and he invented this game, and I've borrowed it, and it's been incredible. What time was like easier for you to make fun of me? The first time or the second time? Well, honestly, I was kind of tripping up, though, on the last, on the last one. I didn't know what to say. I was like, hey, Brooks, get up. I don't think that even made sense. So it was the second time. It's the second time. Yeah, the second, time, second time was harder, and the first time was easier. Because I was. Why was it easier for you to make fun of me the first time? Uh, because you were kind of like digging into me back. You were yeah. picking fights with me and like I knew I could beat you up because you're kind of small. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the thing. Bullies bully for the reaction. To get you crazy or to make you cry. If you take away the reaction and you are calm, don't give them what they want, and you're kind 100% of the time, I'm telling you, it's very difficult for them to keep making fun of you. They actually have a crisis of conscience and they will back off. It's one of the most amazing, brilliant things I've ever seen, all because of the gift of the Golden Rule. Alex, you did a great job. Thanks, man. The Golden Rule. It's biblical. Matthew 7, 12. In everything do to others what you would have them do to you. I'd like to talk to our children and young people. Kids and young people, if you are being bullied, Say a prayer to God. Face the bully with courage using the golden rule approach. If you see someone being bullied, take the time to stop and speak up for the victim. Research tells us that if a third party intervenes with the simple words, stop it, leave him alone or leave her alone, then the bullying will stop. And it is based on another biblical principle, which tells us in Proverbs 31, 8, speak out on behalf of the voiceless and for the rights of all who are vulnerable. If you are a bully yourself, you need to get help. Because if you continue in this negative path, you will face difficulties growing up. And in future, you will have problems fitting into society. Talk to your parents about it, or to an adult you trust if you can't turn to your parents. Parents and grandparents and caregivers, leaders of young people, be vigilant about your children. 
if they show signs of withdrawal, being quiet when they are naturally talkative, if they have dropping grades, they have a fear of going to school, do take the, the time to talk to them in a positive way. Connect with the school to find out what's happening and address it. We all need to do everything within our power to prevent and to stop bullying. When we teach our children how to handle bullying, when we as adults stand up to stop it when it happens, we are cultivating a host of other Christian virtues besides courage and faithfulness. We will have greater self-worth, confidence and reliance. Just as Shipra and Pua exhibited outstanding courage and faithfulness in front of Pharaoh, let us choose to cling on to the fear of the Lord, for it will give us wisdom to face the enemy, whether it be an authority that's demanding you to go against your conscience, a bully, or even just an internal debilitating fear or worry that you have that's holding you captive. Face the enemy, stand firm, and let God win the victory for you. In conclusion, I'd like to share a command direct from the lips of God. He says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. Pilgrims on the journey of the narrow road And those who've gone before us line the way Cheering on the faithful, encouraging the weary Their lives a stirring testament to God's sustaining grace Surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses Let us run the race, not only for the prize But as those who've gone before us Let us leave to those behind us The heritage of faithfulness Passed on through godly life faithful may the fire of our devotion light their way may the footprints that we leave lead them to believe and the lies we live inspire them to obey oh may all who've come behind us find us faithful For all our hopes and dreams have come and gone And our children sift through all we've left behind May the clues that they discover And the memories they uncover Become the light that leads them To the road we each must find Oh, may all who've come behind us find us faithful. May the fire of our 
devotion light their way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the light we live inspire them to obey. Your way. May the footprints that we leave lead them to believe, and the lies we live inspire them to obey. Oh, may all who've come behind us find us faithful. Oh, Shall we all stand for the hymn of benedic benediction? Yes, Lord, we have heard your command loud and clear to be bold and courageous and to be faithful. Oh, Lord, I pray for strength for each one that we will be able to nurture these seeds of courage and faithfulness to face the foe without fear because you are with us and you will always be there to help us. Thank you, Lord. Now may the love of our Heavenly Father, the grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and the communion of our Helper, the Holy Spirit, be with you now and forevermore. Amen.
Please be seated and have a blessed Sabbath day. Thank you. 